Wow. You may be seated. What a thought. That because of Christ, we can take audience with the King of Kings. The Bible tells us that we can boldly approach His throne and there find grace. I wait for the day that I'm, I'm going to be able to just walk into that throne and just say thank you for all that you've done for me. Hallelujah. Preach Pastor John. All the issues, all the fears, all the problems are gone at that point. All the, the stuff that draws me to the wickedness will be gone at that point. And all that will be left in me is just praise. Amen. Oh, what a day. Man. I don't know how that makes you feel. But I'm a pretty wicked dude in myself. But something happened. Mm -hmm. Thank you, God. Amen. That the king would love me so much. Oof. All right. Um, I didn't mean to come up here before I welcome for all that foolishness. <laughs> oh. Sometimes I, I, I think of that song and I think of Paul and that when he was being, when he was uh, apprehended by the Romans. And they were treating him unfairly. Because of his citizenship, because he was a Roman citizen, he had the right to appeal to Caesar. He said, you can't treat me this way. In fact, I want to talk to Caesar. We're citizens of heaven. Amen. So you have a right every day to take audience with the king. Amen. And there, bring your questions, bring your unsureties, bring all the stuff that messes you up, bring that to him because he got it. And say, yo, I, I, don't, I don't understand all this mess that I'm dealing with. I don't understand my issues and my problems. But I understand one thing, that you love me. So now I need you to help me. Appeal to King Jesus. Well, you guys had some homework last week. Who remembers what that was? Okay, did y'all read it? Yes. Did you read it, nephew? <laughs> you don't read it next week because I'm going to blast you. I know. Did you read it, Jerry? I appreciate you not lying. You know? It's all good. Listen, you know, even if you can't read it, <clears throat> there's a couple apps that you can actually listen to it. So reading is challenging for you, and I understand it's for some people uh, reading it's tough, especially when you talk about reading the Bible, but that's why we're doing these exercises. <clears throat> we want to <clears throat> help people uh, find that reading the Word isn't as hard as you think, that it's a lie from the enemy that's telling you you can't read it, that you can't understand it. So we want you to begin to read through it, and we're going to talk about it. We're going to do things a little different. There's going to be times where maybe <clears throat> after we've read a chapter, we're going to come in and have you talk about it. What did you see? What did you understand? What did you hear? Um, because you know what? The Holy Spirit speaks to you as well. And I need you to begin to learn how to recognize His voice talking to you. All right? So we are reading through the Gospel of John, as it says there. And the key... So this book is found at the end of the book. Its purpose is one thing. It says in John 20, 31, But these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. So that's the purpose that all these things that we're going to read through in this book of John 
John wrote them so that we would believe that Jesus Christ is Messiah. That was his purpose. These specific things, because it also tells us that he did many more things. He did many more signs. He did a lot of stuff that isn't even recorded. But they chose these things, these signs. We found last week that John calls them signs. Matthew, Mark, and Luke call them miracles. That's right. We also saw that there's going to be seven I am statements. Christ is going to use I am and have seven things. So we're going to see those seven things again. He had seven signs to show that he was Messiah. Why? So that you and I would believe. And in that belief have life. Believe that Jesus is God. So let's jump right in. Let's go to 1 John 1 through 5. What does it say here? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So the first thing it says here, in the beginning was the word. Now, in the beginning, that kind of takes me back to the book of Genesis. And if you read Genesis 1.1, it says, in the beginning. So the question that I would like to first ask is, in the beginning of what? In the beginning of what? Time. At that point, in the beginning, when God said, let there be, the clock started ticking for mankind. The minute he said, let there be, time started. God did not exist in time. In fact, time is in him. He controls it. He exists outside of time. So when he said in the beginning, he's saying for us in the beginning. Not for him. That's the beginning of time as we know it. Then it says in the beginning was the word. Now the word is a interesting word. In the Greek, it's called logos. Now, that word is used often in the New Testament because it's a Greek word, New Testament. We're going to learn how to be Bible scholars here. So the New Testament was written in Greek. So if you're reading through the New Testament and you want to get a better understanding of a word, go to the Greek and it'll begin to tell you. So the, the Greek word was logos, and it means not just simply a word, but it's more like a concept or a, uh, a, a global understanding of something. Now, again, as I said, that that word was used a lot of times in the New Testament, but it didn't mean technically Christ. But in this context, that word is pointing to God. Why? Because it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. So that means that in the beginning, when God was saying, let there be blah, 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 Jesus was there. And then it says, and the Word again was God. Now, this is very important because if you, there's a few beliefs out here that have changed the Bible. And in fact, there John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. So do you see how it's important to really get this scripture down? Because this is, our Bible says that the Word was God. That's important because of what Jesus came to do. He had to be God. Only God can do it. Then it says, He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made. That puts equality to God. So if anybody ever questions you and says that Jesus is not God, you can take them to John 1.1 and says, No, 
it says here that he was God. God would not share his majesty with anyone. So it ha Jesus had to be God. There was nothing made that was made without him. Now, verse 4 says, In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. Hmm. When we read the Genesis account of the creation of Adam in Genesis 2, what does it say? It says, so let me help you a little bit with Genesis. When you read through Genesis 1, it, that's where you get to let there be light, let there be death, da, 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 and it was good. And, and he just kind of blasts through it all. Then when you go to Genesis 2, he kind of expounds a little bit on what that looked like. Specifically, the creation of man. So in Genesis 2, he talks about how he took the dust of the ground, molded man, and then it says he breathed into him the breath of life, and he became a living soul. So that Jesus is the thing that God used to bring life to man. It also talks about before any of this happened, it says that the earth was without form and darkness. Then light came in and it was separate, like the darkness was separated. Jesus is the light of the world, it tells us here. Then it says that the world did not overcome it. Now, I'm not crazy about that word overcome. Because what does that kind of mean? And I know for most of us, reading through the NIV makes it a little easier, but I promise you, if you want to really grab hold of the Bible, get yourself uh, an NIV, a King James, maybe a New Living Translation, and maybe an Amplified. And if you don't want to go out and buy all those Bibles, you can get those things online. But reading through these different translations, you'll see words that are better suited. And then when you go to the Greek and you understand what they're saying, you'll understand why. Because that word overcome tells me like, kind of like we were trying to, like almost like you were fighting over it. But the true, the truer definition of that word is comprehend. So the word came into the world and the world could not comprehend. King James uses the word comprehend. It's a better word to use to understand what's happening here with the light coming into the world. If the world is in darkness, the light came into it, and the, the, the world could not comprehend that light. They couldn't understand it. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Because yeah. there's a lot of things that are going to happen in your Christian walk that you're not going to understand, and God was involved. God may have allowed some things to happen in your life, and that doesn't make sense because we can't comprehend it all the time. We can't understand the moving of God in our lives. Or how could God allow this or that to happen? And it kind of throws us off a little bit. But it's because we can't understand it. Now, why can't we understand the light? Because sin blocks us. It blocks us from seeing Jesus in every aspect of our life. How do I know that? Let's go back to Genesis. I think we talked about this a little bit ago. When in the beginning, God walked with Adam in the cool of the day. Imagine just strolling through a nice, beautiful, sunny day. Just walking with God. Then when sin came, Adam could no longer find God. It says that he heard an echo. He could hear God as an echo only. So sin came and it blocked Adam's ability to see and hear from God completely. That's why the Bible tells us that now we see in part, we prophesy in part. But then one day we're going to see and fully know him as we're fully known. So sin blocks that. And when sin comes, it blocks out the light. And what does that create? Darkness. Because the definition of darkness, if you really think about darkness, darkness doesn't really exist. 
The scientific definition of dark is the absence of light. In fact, if you were to remove light from this room, it would be totally dark. However, there are still small little light waves even in the darkness. That's why when you put on night vision goggles, you know, those recon dudes, you know what I mean? They can see in the darkness because there's still little small pieces of light in darkness. But imagine a time when there wasn't even that. Darkness is the absence of light. So sin stops us from seeing God's move in our life. God, it's, it prevents us from seeing Christ. Now, when you get into verses 6 through 10, you, you start hearing about this guy named John. Now, the reason John had to come is because the light was about to come into the world and God, John was trying to prepare the world to understand the light. Because if Jesus had to just came without a forerunner, people would have been like, whatever. Because the light cannot comprehend it. And it can't understand it. So, John, so God sent John the Baptist to come into the world and tell that the light was coming. And then they even went on to say that not only was it coming, but it had already been here. Very, very important. He had been here and he had already made everything. So it was a preparation. John's gospel, John's work was a preparation for Jesus coming. And we're going to understand that a little better. But let's now go to verse 11. What does it say here? He, talking about Jesus, came to that which was his own. But his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children not born of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. So, it says that he, Jesus, came into his own, or came to that which was his own. Jesus was a Jew. He was Hebrew. And he came and brought this message to the Hebrews, and the majority of them rejected him. They rejected him. They didn't receive him. Because they were bound into the law and sin. But those that did receive him, it tells us, he gave them the right to become children of God. Now this is an interesting thing. This term, children of God, is like a sonship. It's, it's not the same relationship of Christ and God. Because many times you'll read through the Bible, and what do you hear? Jesus was the Son of God. So here, Jesus makes us children of God, but it's a different type of relationship between Jesus the Christ and the Father than us as his children in the Father. It's a difference, and we're going to begin to see that a little bit. Look at verse 13. It says that he made us children of God. How? Because we believe, but not of natural descent. Really what that saying is, is not of blood. Not of blood. We became children. We were adopted. The Bible talks about that we were grafted in, us Gentiles. So he made us children, but not directly of blood, because of blood. if we were directly of blood, what's in blood? In one drop of blood, there is something called a cell. In that cell is something called DNA. And in your DNA is the genetic makeup that makes you who you are. There are, there are there's an imprint of you in your cell. And those cells are what makes you who you are. Now, that's why a husband and wife, when they come together and they have a child, they resemble the parent. Because there's some form of DNA imprinting that's passed on to the children. But this was a different type of relationship. This looked different. 
It wasn't of blood. Now, it's similar because the Bible says in the beginning, it says that he made man in his own image. But if you had a direct DNA type of a relationship with God, then you would be God yourself. Only Christ could be God. So if you look at this beginning part of John, John is trying to lay out to us who Jesus is. He's trying to lay out to us that he is God. Though he's going to look like a man, he's going to walk like a man, he's going to have the same feelings of a man, but he is God. It also says that not of a human decision. You know, husbands and wives decide to have kids. Sometimes they don't. <clears throat> Sometimes there's surprises. Or a husband's will. But we were born of God. That's what makes us sons of God, children of God. Now, here is probably one of the most. This is the reason that I'm kind of really moving slow here, and I know it may seem a little lethargic, but this idea that Jesus is 100% God and 100% man is a tough concept to grab hold of. Because in one sense, we can put Jesus on this pedestal and we can say, He's Jesus, he, He's God, He's all-powerful. No wonder He did good. But see, He was also embodied with all the same potential frailties as man. Because he was wrapped in flesh. His father was God the Father, and his earthly mother was of the flesh. So he was 100% God. We call this to say, as it says in verse 14, the word put on flesh. This is a special act of love. I, I can't understand that. I can't understand, that would be like me who work every day, trying to hold it down for my family, serving, doing all these things, saying, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go live in a crack house. I'm going to be around the worst of the worst. I'm going to start running with drug dealers. And I'm going to get captured. And I'm going to go to jail for it. And I'm going to be beaten for it. And I'm going to be accused as to being a drug dealer when I was innocent. That they wouldn't have to deal with the penalties of their actions. Look at it. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. That's what He did. He became a human. God's spirit wrapped in flesh. And then it says, we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. The one and only son. When you look at that, we're going to see that term again. In the Greek, it's, uh, it, 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 the word is begotten. And it's an interesting word. It's the, the, the word in the Greek, I think it's I didn't write it down this time. It's monades. Please don't quote me on that. But what it means is that there is only one of his kind. There's only one person that carries the fullness of the God in him as a man. There's only one of him. We may have became children of God because of what Jesus did, but we didn't become Jesus. We didn't become a, a, a direct, exact imprint of God as Jesus was. See, that's why it says that we've seen His glory, the glory of the only one, of, the only, the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. That's why it says that because when they gazed upon Christ, they were gazing upon the Father. I'm sure that Moses, in some way, was looking up, saying, "Wow, you got to see Him." In your flesh. 
<clears throat> Moses was the one that, that cried out to God and, and, and all that he did and up on that mountain he yelled, God please if I could just see your face. And God looked down at Moses and said, you know, I, I can't let you see my face because it would destroy you in your flesh. So I'm going to hide you where? Where? In a rock. In a cleft of a rock. In, a, in an opening in a rock. Even in the Old Testament. Remember we said Jesus was here before. Even in the Old Testament there was an image of Christ in the rock that Moses was hating because we can only see God through Christ. The only way for Moses to catch a glimpse of who God was because he was hidden in the rock in Christ. He put on flesh. Special kind of love. Now, here's the thing. As I said, he was 100% God. Look at verse 16. Out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of the grace that was already given. That's a little confusing of a scripture, because what does that mean? What grace was already given? If Jesus came and he embodied grace, what grace was already given? That grace that it's talking about there was the law. And you're like, whoa, Paul kind of disses the law a little bit when he read through some of this stuff. That grace that was already given was the law. Why is that the case? Because what did Paul say about the law? He said, I didn't know that I was sinful until I read the law and they told me that I was sinful. But that's important. That's grace. That's just like your child doing something wrong and you don't tell them that it's wrong and then they touch the fire and get burned. Whose fault? Yours. You didn't instruct your child. You didn't raise them up in the admonition of the Lord. The grace that was already given was the law. I needed that law to tell me that I was bad. Because if not, I'd be so blinded by sin that I would never turn to the things of God. I would never do it. Out of his fullness we have all received grace in place of the grace already given. For the law was given through Moses, grace that came through Christ Jesus. So there was grace in the law, and then grace, more grace came because Jesus fulfilled the law. The law was never something to be tried to fulfill. It was impossible. That's why he said, I'm giving you the law to show you that you're sinful. But in the law, I'm going to make provisions so that you can get through. That's why he had sacrifices set up. God would never put a heavy weight on your shoulder like sin exposing you to your understanding of sin and then not give you a way out of that sin. That's why he says that in every temptation I've given you a way out. Because see, if you carry the heavy weight of sin on your shoulders yourself, then you'll end it. Or you'll figure out a way to try to relieve that pressure, whether it be drugs, sex, whatever it is. That's what you're going to do. So the law he gave through Moses and then says, now I'm going to definitely let you not have to carry that weight anymore because I'm going to bring Christ that's going to fulfill the law and that's going to be the thing that's going to remove the weight completely for you. Verse 18. No one has ever seen God but the only, but the one and only Son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father has made him known. See, we need Christ in a lot of different ways. Of course, we need his actions, that, his death that, 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 that made us clean. But I needed to see how to live life. I need to read how Christ lived and walked on this earth because I need something that shows how it's supposed to be done. How many times have people come at him and challenge him with things or, or come at him? How did he handle that? How many times do people come at us? And we get, you know, oh, whoa, you go. We ready to start swinging and fighting. Yeah, I can't hold that too long. 
I've been playing ball on Monday though. Anyway, any of you young men want to come out and play ball with us? We have a little fun. Oh, you can get it. Whatever. Whatever. So we needed to learn how to live life. We needed to learn how to handle things. People always say, well, look, I can get angry. Jesus got angry and turned over the tables. Listen, let me explain something to you. That wasn't anger. Jesus was just a little perturbed. He was just a little bit upset. If you want to see his anger, read through Revelation. And hailstones the size of Volkswagens is dropping out of the sky. And all kind of crazy stuff like that's happening. That's God's anger. Fire. Wrath. That's his anger. Jesus was just a little bit, yeah, I mean, that's all he was. He was just trying to show him a little something. So that we could understand. Now, there's this dude named John the Baptist that we briefly talked about. Now, he was a little bit of a weirdo in the world's eyes. A little bit. He says he ate locusts. Eel. Eel. I mean, every boy ate an ant or something when they were little. You ain't never eaten no ant? <laughs> Come on, man. You have to play it in your boy. I dare you to eat it. No. I dare you to eat it. What's boy stuff? That's why it's very easy. Mud pies. Mud pies and all that. John the Baptist was an interesting dude. He was very different than many of the other prophets that went before him. In fact, Jesus said he was the greatest prophet because he heralded the coming of the Messiah. He makes a very interesting statement in verse 29. Look at it. It says, the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him. See, John had a following. John was known as the Baptist because he was running around yelling for people to repent and be baptized. And people were listening to that because it was different. It wasn't about the law. It wasn't about you need to bathe. You need to do all these things. He was just saying, listen, Messiah is coming. Repent and be baptized. Whoa, I can do that. No, I can't live that law thing. You're talking about all of the hundreds. Of, I can't do all that. Matter of fact, I can't even afford a dove. But you know what I can do? I can come and I can repent and be baptized. So John had a following. And it says here that he saw Jesus coming toward him and he said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Whoa! The Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. So, if Jesus was coming and he was the Messiah, John now calls him a Lamb. That's against what they were originally thinking Messiah was going to do. Messiah was supposed to come and free them from all the drama that was going on. John prophetically here says, the Lamb. Now listen, the reason he said lamb was because they understood what the role of a lamb was. Because they had been taught sacrifice since they were children. He was telling them, Messiah is coming. There he is. He's coming. He's a lamb that's going to take away the sins of the world. A lamb means that I've got to sacrifice. That means that he's going to die. But sin kept them from fully understanding that. Look at verse 30. This is the one I meant when I said, a man comes after me, has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. Why is that the case? How did baptizing with water reveal Christ? Because Jesus was the light of the world. And he was coming into darkness. And the darkness could not understand it. But the baptism helped you understand it. Why? Because if I admit the fact that I'm broken, that I'm messed up, now I can look and see Christ. Because now I'm not looking at my actions as something that's going to justify me. 
Now, because I said the right amount of prayers, or I sacrificed the right amount of doves, or I did the right stuff in the temple, that's not going to make me holy. But because of the fact that now I realize that I'm still broken, I'm still messed up, now I can see Christ for who he is. The propitiation for my sin. That's why water baptism was interesting, because it wasn't... Washing by water wasn't something foreign to the Israelites. They've been washing at the labor in front of the tent of meeting for years. In front of the Holy of Holies for years. But it was admitting that I'm a sinner and I needed cleansing that helped me open my eyes to who Jesus was. Jesus came to show us the way through him. See, I can deceive myself into thinking that I'm all right because I'm not such of a bad guy. I'm not on America's Most Wanted or anything like that. Or maybe you cleaned your room today. Or maybe you took out the trash. Maybe you're not one of those boys that's working out of a trap house, selling drugs. Maybe that's not you. So that you can deceive yourself into thinking that I'm pretty good. But I promise you, you like myself, we've got something. And that's what Jesus needed us to get rid of. All you have to do is believe. Look at this. Let's keep reading. We're going to close here in a second. Verse 32. Then John gives his testimony. I saw the Spirit coming down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. See, listen, John's baptism made it possible for us to see God. His message of repentance, of, of, of expressing the fact that I'm a mess, helped us see Christ. Now that we see him, as John said, there he is. He told his disciples, don't follow me anymore. Go with him. I don't need you to follow me. I don't need you as a congregation to follow John Gaines. I need you to follow Christ. As he leads and guides you. That was John's message to them. And he was saying to you, hey, listen, repent. Admit that I'm a mess. Now Jesus is going to come, die for your sins, and then he's going to do something interesting. He's going to baptize you as well with the Holy Spirit. That happens the minute you accept Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior. When, that, when, you, when you say those words, Lord, forgive me. I believe that you sent your son Jesus to come into my life, to come into this world, to forgive of my sins. Forgive me. I love you. Come into my heart. When that happens, the Spirit comes inside of you, baptizes you. Then what happens is, all of a sudden, there's a manifestation of that Spirit inside of you. That's the difference. That's when all of a sudden the, there's an outward expression of what has happened on the inside. That Jesus' baptism is with the Holy Spirit. And when it comes out, it comes out in a lot of different ways. In some people they speak in tongues. Some people prophesy. Some people preach. Some people all of a sudden have a boldness that they've never had before. And they speak things that they didn't know they understood. But the truth is, it's all about Christ. It's all about a testament of who Jesus was and is. That baptism of the Holy Spirit will give you something. It will give you something. In Italian, it's called la potenza. In French, it's called persuas. In the Greek, it's exosia. In Spanish, it's el poder. I know it because it happened to me and it brought me power. That spirit will bring you power 
to overcome the darkness in your life. When I believe, the Spirit will come and give me power to tell of the good news that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world.